The scripture reading for today is from Acts chapter 17, <coughs> verses 22 to 34, and can be found on page 902 of your pew Bibles. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our, your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Arapagate, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Here ends, the, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> So uh, imagine you're having lunch with a group of friends, and the topic turns to criticizing religion. And one of the friends turns to you, and you can put your name in here, and says, uh, Todd, you're religious, right? How can you believe this stuff? What do you say? And maybe even more importantly, how do you feel? Me too, right? I, I, I would get anxious, and and my hands might get a little clammy, and, and uh, my, my voice or words or thoughts might get a little constricted uh, if I knew I was in an unfriendly crowd. Um, and, and, and yet, I, and you might say to me, well, well Todd, you know, I, I probably honestly wouldn't say much because for me, uh, religion is personal. And, and besides, I don't want to get in an argument. And, and I agree with you on both of those things, too. I'll only, I'll only say or add the caveat that a religion is personal but never private. Why do I say that? Well, to paraphrase uh, Pasquale, there's a God-shaped hole in every heart. So every human being in some way or another is longing, whether they're aware of it or not, for some sort of healthy God talk. If that's true, and I believe it is, then then how do we talk about faith in a secular world? In our study of Acts, we've come to the point uh, of Paul, uh, the greatest missionary of the Christian church, who's now on his third missionary journey. And, and let's just see how Paul does it in Acts chapter 17. First thing we notice is that Paul sees the need. Paul got to his uh, appointment in Athens a little early, so he... Uh, you know, in, in the ancient world, he didn't travel much, so he's walking around Athens, noticing everything, and he sees all of these shrines to, to so many gods, and, and he realizes that the Greeks are trying to reach for something beyond whether they see that as God or the gods. And so, though the scripture doesn't say this, one can imagine from Paul's life that he prays for them. Well, you see the needs of the people around you at your lunch table too, right? 
There's John who works uh, that rat race seven days a week all the time, and, and you know that part of the reason he does it is because he's lonely. Or there's Mary who can be a little flirtatious, and, and you know that she's that way because you've heard her say that she's unhappy at home. And, and so you can pray for them at the point of their need. And if our faith talk begins where their need ends, then that should uh, relax some of our anxiety because we're no longer imposing some faith upon people who don't need or want it. We're trying to help meet a need. John, this is how my faith helps me. When I'm lonely, I realize there's a, a loving presence with me always. Or, or, or Mary... Uh, when, when I'm unhappy at home, I, I pray for my spouse and I try to pray through enough till I pray for my, see my own faults and pray for, my, for me to, to, to be better or whatever you say. But, but there's power in that. And yet, even if we do that, uh, we'll be criticized. Um, no, that was, uh, that was the one about Paul walking around after. Got to do that. Uh, Paul's criticized him. He also had debates and had the and still thoughts. Where he told them about Jesus and the resurrection, they said, What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? So you can criticize him. But the other part of that is that Paul was also invited to the Areopagus. Now, here's what you need to know about Athens Athens was sort of the Princeton of the ancient world, in that it was a university town, a lot of intellectuals and elites and, and uh, high-powered people, and, and they loved nothing more than a new idea. This whole idea about Jesus and resurrection was a new idea. So, so Paul was invited. They wanted to hear more, even as some people criticized him. So Paul has an opportunity, after he's seen the need, to share the story. Interesting thing about Paul, if you study him through the book of Acts, and if you've been here the last few weeks we've begun this, um, uh, Paul shares his faith differently in every different setting. Why is that? Well, because Paul is starting with their need, not some canned approach that he's learned. Uh, here you, you, you read, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars has this inscription on it, to an unknown God. So he starts with one of their idols, one of their shrines. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He couldn't say that in Ephesus or, or Philippi or, or other places. And, and when he does this, it's, as I've already said, it's, it's not a canned approach. I, I was taught 40 years ago about the time I went to a Christian college that, that I was supposed to ask one particular question when faith came up with any secular audience. And that question was this. Joe, if you, and it's important to use their name, sales pitch, right? Joe, if you were to die tonight and stand before God, and God was to say to you, Joe, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? That's a horrible question. That's a horrible way to try to share faith. You know, in 32 years of ministry, I have rarely, if ever, had anybody come to me worried about the eternal destiny of their soul. People don't care about that. Don't think about that normally. You know what they come to me concerned about? Their broken marriage. Their prodigal daughter. The fact that there's, there's more bills at the end of the paycheck at the end of the month. The, the emptiness that they feel sometimes inside. And, and you got to start there and build from there in order to meet real needs. So Paul's story varies <coughs> as should ours, depending on the needs. Um, in this case, what Paul does is he... Uh, he uses not only their, their shrine to an unknown God, but then he goes on and quotes some of their poets. Uh, God's purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he's not <coughs> far away from any of us. 
For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So, so he takes from their, from their culture, from their words, from their thoughts, and builds from that. And, and indeed, uh, that's why he gets a hearing. And basically, if you read through this, what you find is that Paul begins to say, well, you know, when, when you worship these shrines, these idols as we call them in the Jewish tradition, what you find is they make God into human, in, in demands, out of man, demands image. They make God like us. And, and what Jesus did is Jesus uh, loved us and showed us how we are made in God's image. And, and furthermore, Paul says, that in Easter, in the resurrection, these are the earliest Easter people, uh, Jesus uh, sort of scoops us up and raises us above our vision, uh, above that which it normally is, and so we can see a God of love and justice and power and, and, and can live into that more fully in our life and make the world more reflective of that around us until it's consummated when Christ really comes here. Powerful thoughts for the Princeton of the ancient world. Uh, the president of the Keyport Garden Club uh, is a nature worshiper. Now, you'd expect that, right? Garden Club, nature, they're getting ready for their big uh, garden walk in June 1 and 2, where uh, 30 or 40, I think 40 or 50 actually, Victorian houses. Uh, transform into beautiful gardens and people walk around and pay money and uh, well, gets, gets money to function. Uh, and so she says she worships nature. In her words, she says, uh, Todd, uh, my religion is nature. So that's good. But you get about one glass of wine into <laughs> dinner and she starts pouring out her pain about her drug addict son who calls her multiple times during the day and sometimes high. And you can understand as a mother that, that she would have so much pain. And, and so, so I try in, in some way to say, uh, you know, Mariah, if, if nature is your religion, then suffering is baked in. And there's no yeast to rise above the status quo uh, and, and put the suffering into a greater perspective. And it hasn't hit yet. And I don't say it unless it seems appropriate at the time. Um, but, but here's what I've noticed. Uh, when we're at our house, they ask us to say grace. They ask me to say grace. And if, I, if they forget, often they'll be at the door and they'll say, Todd, we forgot to say grace. And we'll join hands and we'll pray. And I always pray to a God that's not confined to flowers and trees, but a God that's above and beyond more powerful, and more loving, that has a purpose, that can put her pain into perspective, that can, that can give her strength to deal with the daily barrage of calls. I pray someday she'll get it. And that, Paul sees a need, Paul shares a story, and lastly, Paul allows for a varied response. Um, here's here's where, where I fail. I'm not a great salesman, you know. The, the best salesmen are persistent, you know. On, on the sixth try, they, uh, they find a way to connect, right? Five no's to a yes. I, I'm too quick to take the first or second or third no and just forget about it, right? But, but, but that's not, that doesn't work well. So what does Paul do? When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. There's varied responses. We'll get laughed and scoffed at. We'll have people who are interested and want to talk more about it. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that's the power to allow for, for to, to be confident despite varied responses. And then, you know what, I didn't, didn't keep a, I think I kept this slide for this one. I think this is my last slide. <coughs> yep, that is. And then there's not only a varied response, but there's varied responders. In the very last verse of the text, it talks about two people who come to faith. One is Dionysus, sort of a professor of physics uh, at, at the Athenian University, an intellectual elite. 
And then there is the Mar Damaris, who the context seems to give the idea that she was a shamed and lowly woman. And you think about the difference of those people. And they were the beginning of the Athenian house church that sat together around that table, shared the Lord's Supper together, and began to learn and grow in faith and share it with others until more and more and more house churches came and eventually the world was transformed. So, I can understand being anxious uh, in a secular world when faith comes up. But I would also say to myself first and then to you, let's be bold. Because we have no idea what God can do for the Dionysuses and Demarises of our day. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the power of the resurrection and what it did in Paul's life and what it did in Athens and, and the then known world. And we thank and praise you for what you're doing today. And I read again this week that, that college campuses are, and, and Christian groups on college campuses are seeing more openness than they've seen in decades as, as people are hungry for spirituality and faith for something beyond. And so are all those around us whether they've been burned by the church or not. Help us to help them so that you can be more honored in this world. We give ourselves to this. In your name we pray and all God's people say.